Welcome to this session, Professor Linda Bottrell, who will be talking to us about the city and the bush. And uh, Linda is Professor in Australian Politics and Associate Dean Research in the Faculty of Business, Government and Law at the University of Canberra. She's written extensively on rural policy and politics in Australia, including as co-editor of and contributor to the National Party, Prospects for the Great Survivors, and author of Wheat Marketing in Transition, The Transformation of the Australian Wheat Board. She has a particular research interest in the role and values in the policy process. And prior to her academic career, Linda spent 15 years in public policy practice, most of which was in the area of rural policy. She was elected as a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia in 2015. Today, Linda will argue that in the century plus that it has been a force in Australian politics, the National Party has embodied country mindedness and has been an effective advocate for the bush. This paper that she will be delivering will explore the influence of this Australian variant of agrarianism on policy and politics in the Howard era, highlighting the similarities and differences between the values and policy objectives of the two parties. Linda, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank David and Andrew for inviting me to be part of this conference. As we've been hearing today, the success of the coalition can be attributed to the synergies and commonalities between policy approaches of the two parties across a wide range of policy issues. Industrial relations is an obvious area in which the two parties share a common approach, and they are also largely in lockstep on economic policy, with occasional disagreements over trade policy when the interests of agricultural producers are seen to be threatened. And during the Howard government, an example of this was the treatment of sugar in the US trade, free trade agreement. Overall, though, the two parties are in harmony on the direction of government policy. And this closeness of the relationship has tended to baffle international scholars who have an interest in coalition governments, with much of the literature treating Australia as a two party system. What this misinterpretation fails to recognise is the importance of the National Party's distinct identity, an identity that is anchored in the bush and that is based on the juxtaposition of the rural and the urban. The term country-mindedness has been associated with the country and National Party since the 1920s. It's a uniquely Australian term. However, the set of sentiments that it encapsulates belong to a value set that is common across Western culture. These values can broadly be described as agrarian, and they have a history that dates back to Aristotle. In summary, agrarianism is a set of broadly held values and beliefs that attributes to agriculture, farmers and their communities a particular set of virtues and characteristics that distinguish them in a normatively desirable way from urban people, communities and occupations. One of its strongest manifestations was in the agrarian democracy of Thomas Jefferson, who saw agriculture not only as a primarily a source of wealth, but also of human virtues and traits that have been described as most congenial to popular self-government. It had a sociological rather than an economic value. As a leading scholar on Jefferson notes, this is a dominant note in all his writings on the subjects. Definitions and explanations of agrarian sentiment vary, but they all have in common this sense of the nobility of agricultural activity and its fundamental importance as the basis, not just of the economy, but also of society. In his account of country mindedness, Don Aitken also highlighted the point that because of the special nature of farming and rural communities, it was seen as important for there to be a political party to represent this constituency. The National Party is one of the few remaining, if not the last, farmer-based party in the developed world. Now, while it makes sense that farmers and their communities think that what they do is fundamentally important, one of the most interesting features of agrarianism is the extent to which this belief in the special status of farmers extends into the broader community. Research in Australia has consistently shown that people across the political spectrum and across demographic groups hold farmers and farming in high regard. This sentiment is essentially a cultural truism 
in that it is an accepted value set that many people do not realise they hold and if challenged would not be able to defend. It also means that there is much scope to provide differential, favourable levels of support to farmers because country-mindedness does not split along party lines. For example, the Labor Party cannot afford to be seen to be mean to farmers because it will likely cross the votes in Western Sydney. Programs like The Farmer Wants a Wife attract audiences from across the political spectrum because farmers are seen as desirable husband material and raising children in rural areas is seen as positive. To date, there do not seem to be plans to screen an urban counterpart in the form of The Plumber Wants a Wife. Of course, there may be a shortage of marriageable women in rural Australia, but I suspect this is not the case. The argument that I'm going to present in this paper is that country mindedness, mindedness has generally served the coalition and the National Party well. It has allowed the coalition to capture the votes of those who are ideologically further to the right of the Liberal Party and those who may be tempted to take their vote elsewhere. The coalition arrangement has allowed latitude to be extended to maverick backbench National Party members providing for a diversity of voices to be heard in policy debate, while not necessarily influencing policy outcomes. Once National Party members move into the ministry, however, they adopt a different style from that of popular and at times populist backbenchers. For example, Deanne Kelly clearly tempered her more populist positions when promoted to the ministry. One of my former students referred to this promotion as the lure of the big white car and argued that some National Party members have consciously jettisoned any ministerial ambition in the interest of pursuing party goals and ma maintain their position as outspoken advocates for their constituencies. For many of its supporters, it's the mere existence of the National Party that matters. As a blogger wrote in 2008 during the debate around wheat legislation in the, the Rudd government, what hope would rural Australia have of being heard if it were not for the National Party? And this is the essence of agrarian sentiment, that urban people do not understand or represent rural issues, that the rural is uniquely valuable to national culture, and that rural policy needs to be in the hands of rural people. While farmers and their representatives are comfortable and feel qualified to engage in debates about non-farm policy, they are quick to cast doubts on the views of rural policy commentators who do not have direct ties to the bush. As a rural policy scholar, I am frequently asked if I grew up on a farm. My colleagues engaged in research on other policy issues do not seem to get asked a similar question. The National Party taps into these sentiments very effectively in portraying itself as the only true representative of farmers and rural people, even though both Labor and the Liberal Party hold rural seats. And as we heard earlier, on occasion, the Liberal Party has held more rural seats than the National Party. While overall it's clear that the embodiment of country-mindedness in the National Party has served the coalition well, these sentiments and their impact on policy gave rise to one of the few major scandals of the Howard era, AWB Limited's activities under the UN Oil for Food Programme. In the case of AWB Limited, the process that led to what I've called the very peculiar privatisation was a consequence of a mix of agrarian values and also of governments, both Labor and the Coalition, largely leaving the restructure of the old statutory Australian Wheat Board to the industry to decide. This approach of letting the farmers decide their own futures and policy settings is consistent with Blackjack McEwen's statement to Parliament in 1965 that, and I quote, my attitude is that neither the Australian Country Party nor the parliamentary members should decide what is the correct policy for primary industry. It has always been the policy of my party that those who produce, own and sell a product are the best judges of the way in which their property should be treated. It is the function of my party to see that the will of those who produce and own the product is carried into legislative and administrative effect. In Labor's case, leaving the wheat restructured debate to industry likely reflected a reticence to dabble in rural issues in light of my previous point about the perception of who is qualified to speak on behalf of farmers and communities. I'm not going to go into all of the details of the oil for food scandal because I think it was well reported at the time and I'm sure members of the government who are here today remember it all too well. <laughs> 
What I am going to do, though, is present an analysis of the causes of the scandal, which I argue lies in the uncomfortable compromise that have resulted from the industry-led process, process of privatisation. This ultimately left the government embroiled in a scandal which, I argue, it could have avoided. The debate around the privatisation of the Australian Wheat Board arose from a number of factors, which included the deregulation of the domestic wheat market by the Labor government in 1989, the Hilma Report International Competition Policy, which had highlighted agricultural statutory marketing arrangements as being of particular concern, and budgetary concerns associated with the government guarantee of the Wheat Board's annual borrowings to cover advance payments made to government, to, sorry, to growers on the delivery of wheat. Consideration of an alternative structure for the Wheat Board began during the Keating government and was largely conducted through a tripartite working group comprising the Wheat Board itself, the Grains Council of Australia and the Department of Primary Industries and Energy. The policy approach at the time was that the debate would be industry led and growers were consulted in a series of 22 grower meetings across the wheat producing areas of Australia in September, October 1995. As manager of strategic planning at the Grains Council of Australia at that time, I attended all of these meetings and subsequently analysed the feedback received from those present. The meeting produced two very clear priorities for the industry. Growers wanted to retain the Wheat Board's export monopoly, the so-called single desk, and they wanted grower control of any restructured entity. These discussions all took place against a backdrop of a pending examination of wheat marketing legislation as part of the legislative review process under national competition policy. The growers were concerned that a privatised company would be obliged to maximise returns to shareholders rather than to growers, and this was of particular concern if those shareholders included individuals or institutional investors who were not grain growers. The Howard government largely continued the process begun by its predecessors, but had the much harder task of actually putting the industry model into effect. The outcome was a two-stage process with complex ownership arrangements and the establishment of a wheat export authority to oversee the management of the single desk. As the legislation was debated, fractures were evidenced in the coalition with Liberal members of the government, notably Wilson Tucky, outspoken in opposition to the proposed model. As an aside, it's worth noting that wheat industry policy has been subject to differences within the coalition for decades. The Nationals have voted against their coalition partners on a number of key pieces of legislation in relation to the grains industries. industry, and members of both coalition parties have been vocal in putting their views on the public record in the parliament. The growers largely got what they wanted and in so doing set the government up to become embroiled in the oil for food scandal. The average person, and dare I say many commentators, did not understand that the government had limited scope to scrutinise the details of AWB Limited's transactions in Iraq. When AWB Limited's involvement in the oil for food scandal came under the scrutiny of the coal inquiry in 2006, much of the focus was on who knew what and when. And of course, opponents of the Howard government were hoping for at least a ministerial scalp. There was a lot of attention to what DFAT knew or should have known and why they didn't more closely scrutinize the contracts and identify the inflation of wheat prices that was the mechanism for paying kickbacks to the Iraqi government. While there is scope to debate the terms of reference of the coal inquiry, Four of the recommendations in the final report go to the heart of the constraints facing both DFAT and the Wheat Export Authority in obtaining accurate information from AWB Limited. Information which would have enhanced the government's capacity to uncover the scandal and to act in response. As a monopoly exporter, AWB Limited and its predecessors also had a monopoly on expertise in the complexity of export wheat contracts. This wasn't an issue when the Australian Wheat Board was a government body because the statutory authority could be consulted readily by other government departments for information on wheat export issues. Following privatisation though, much of the information around contracts became commercial in confidence and DFAT simply did not have the expertise to scrutinise independently the contracts it was forwarding to the UN.
It is also very clear from the transcript of the hearings conducted by Commissioner Cole that AWB went to considerable lengths to cover its tracks. Importantly too, the culture within AWB Limited revealed by the inquiry was consistent with the underlying principles on which the company was constructed, the imperative of maximising returns to growers. This is, the, is reflected in the reaction of many growers to the revelations of the coal, the coal inquiry and the UN Volcker inquiry that preceded it. Rather than being critical of AWB Limited, a common response was to rationalise the behaviour in terms of this is the way business is done in the Middle East and the importance of protecting a critical export market from competition, particularly from American companies. The treatment of farmers by Australian governments of all political persuasions is an illustration of what is known in the academic literature as the social construction of target populations. Policy choices frequently involve identifying groups within the community that are worthy of government policy support and those that aren't, or those that can be left to decide policy for themselves. The Elizabethan poor laws distinguish between the deserving and the undeserving poor, for example. These classifications do not arise naturally or autonomously. They are the product of cultural biases, historical accident and value judgments. Once a group, for example, mothers, have been identified as worthy of support, there is something of a cultural halo effect as the general population receives the message that this particular group is important. By contrast, groups that are treated punitively by policy are seen in a more negative light. Even if the original construction was based in societal values, the subsequent policy response reinforces those values in the public's mind. Farmers and rural communities tend to be constructed positively in the public mind. And as such, this gives governments considerable latitude in terms of policy positions. The outcome of this can be more generous support programs compared with other groups in the community often justified by reference to the special circumstances faced by farmers, such as the vagaries of the weather, vulnerability to volatile world markets, and so on. Because farmers and rural communities are positively regarded by the community, policies that impact on this group are subject to less public scrutiny and debate than other issues. Drought policy is debated among a small group of policymakers and interested academics, but reporting on drought tends to be framed in values terms that are sympathetic to the plight of farmers. Research has shown that even against a backdrop of decades of market liberalism, such as reduced government intervention in the economy, privatisation and deregulation, the majority of Australians believe that farmers as a group deserve more or much more government support. This uncritical acceptance of rural policy, unless it's seen to be too mean, paved the way for the approach to the restructure of the Australian Wheat Board, which was based on the industry's wishes. As a thought experiment, I suggest that the privatisation of few other statutory authorities would not have been left in the hands of the authority itself, its suppliers and the public service. And such a process would certainly have not effectively allowed the retention of a monopoly in the hands of a private company. In spite of decades of speculation about the imminent demise of the National Party, I am of the view that it will continue to be an important part of the political landscape in Australia, particularly if it continues to identify strongly with country mindedness and promote itself as the authentic voice of rural Australia, in spite of the demographic trends that David Lovell mentioned this morning. Its influence over policies of direct interest to that constituency will also continue as long as the general population continues to hold positive, sympathetic views of rural Australia and remains largely unquestioning of rural policy settings as a consequence. Research that I've conducted with my colleagues shows that country-mindedness and agrarian sympathy remain strong in the community. And although young people are showing signs of more positive attitudes towards urban people and lifestyles, they still ascribe positive attributes to rural people and communities. This will continue to give the nationals within the coalition the scope to pursue policies that are favourable to their constituency, even if they may be inconsistent with approaches in other areas of government policy. Thank you. Linda, thank you very much. It's a, a thorough 
presentation that uh, you've given us and we look forward to fleshing this discussion out further in your, your chapter. So thank you for that. I'm sure that a certain Joel from Cessnock was paying attention uh, to your presentation, but we have a question from David um, Lovell and that it's, how does this country minded sentiment in Australia compare with other advanced economies that still have large, often industrial farming sectors, such as the United States and Europe? Um, agrarian sentiment remains very strong in those countries. And one of the fascinating thing about agrarianism is that it's very malleable. So it can be used rhetorically, both by the advocates of industrial farming, as well as the advocates of family farming. Um, country mindedness tends to be associated with family farming, particularly in Australia, but it's been used by the National Farmers Federation to great effect, even though the NFF tends, has tended in the past to be more representative of the big end of agriculture. So it's a very flexible and malleable notion, but it is still quite strongly held in um, most Western countries. Oh, thank you for that. I just think that one of the things, uh, if we have a look at the changing demographic of, of regional seats, uh, Rob Oakeshott was, you know, obviously a federal member for um, Line, and that was an area that he just described as, you know, on one level high unemployment, on the other, uh, God's waiting room. So being able to draw that country mindedness uh, ethos to people who have come from the city for that sea change. Uh, how do you see that actually happening going as we progress? People with COVID, we discussed this earlier today that people have decided they've had enough of the city, they're moving out. Um, do they suddenly change uh, in their, their thinking just because they've moved to an area? Well, they tend to, as I, as I mentioned, um, people actually hold these country-minded sentiments even very much in the city. So part of the idea of the tree change is to move away from the undesirable um, environment of the city to the more desirable um, environment of rural areas. So we all hold these sentiments to, um, to a, a fairly um, strong extent, even though it's un unacknowledged. So often I, I give presentations to people about agrarianism in Australia and I produce the statistics about how strongly it's held. And you see that light bulb moment in the audience when you can see that people are actually recognised it in themselves. And what I didn't mention was that, that the rural myth, if you like to call it that, is also very much tied up with national identity because of the very tight interweaving of country mindedness with the Anzac legend in this country. So there's large amounts of towns in rural Australia, particularly in New South Wales, where there's cenotaphs, there's avenues of remembrance. I and mean, people in Canberra will know of the avenue of remembrance of poplars as you drive into Braidwood. Braidwood has a large number of, of war memorials and cenotaphs and memorial lamps and so forth. Um, and much of rural Australia does actually centre the Anzac legend. So in a sense, the, there's a tangling up of those two origin myths um, in the national identity, which I think strengthens the, the country element. And of course, a lot of our country towns lost a lot of good young men uh, serving um, our country and they, they, some never recovered, but uh, thank you for mentioning that. Um, look, I think we'll uh, finish up there, if that's okay with you. And again, thank you very much for your effort in uh, preparing your paper for today. And we hope you've enjoyed listening in. And I think the next speaker, you may wanna just hang out uh, and just hear, hear what he has to say. Um, but on behalf of everyone, uh, Linda, thank you very much for your time and your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you.